Despite growing up in the 1980s and being totally obsessed with music, I never really came across vinyl records in their heyday. You see, my family were not particularly into music and most of the music we did have was on these horrible cassette tapes, still nasty to this day. I got my first tape Walkman when I was 12 years old, so listening to tapes on that and on our old Panasonic boombox were the only options I had when I started buying my own music. Then came CDs, followed by digital downloads and then streaming. So the whole kind of record thing passed me by. Fast forward 30 years and a new rough trade record shop opens up in Nottingham where I live. I was curious, so I poked my head in, expecting to see the usual racks and racks of CDs. So you can imagine my surprise when I found it full of vinyl records, new ones, and tremendously nerdy but friendly music geeks, both staff and customers alike, who were only too happy to talk music esoterica. And bizarrely, the one thing that they were all keen on was vinyl. So I thought I'd take the plunge and see where the spinning rabbit hole would take me. Five years later now in 2022, what do I really think about vinyl records? So the first thing I found out when embarking upon my vinyl journey is that the associated paraphernalia is confusing both to buy as well as to set up and use. After loads of online research and with budget constraints in mind, I plumped for my first turntable, which was a Sony model. Now the reason I went for this one in particular is it seemed to be a good entry-level turntable, well-reviewed, although that doesn't really mean anything, does it? With the ability to manually change the spinning speed uh, by means of a knob rather than fiddling around with belts and such like. It also came with a built-in preamp stage, meaning I could just hook it up straight away to my amplifier without buying a phono stage. More about that later. It also offered a USB output to rip vinyl records to digital sp files, specifically DSD in this case. At the time, I thought that feature would be super useful, but I've rarely taken advantage of it since buying it. Setting the thing up was fiddly and involved adjusting a counterweight on the tone arm. You see, you have to learn a whole new lingo just to get to grips with vinyl. Uh, and this is to ensure that you have just the right amount of downforce of the stylus on the record. Too much downforce and you risk damaging the record grooves. Too little and the needle will fly out of the groove and cause an equal amount of damage. It gets kind of precarious. I later got a second uh, turntable, a second-hand model. It was another well-reviewed entry-level model, the Project Carbon. Now, this is altogether a snazzier, trendier-looking affair with an Autophon red cartridge, which is meant to be very good. Uh, but this model does need a dedicated phono stage, which is a separate expense. Now, the phono stage, if you don't know what one is, is basically like a little mini preamplifier which takes a signal from the stylus and amplifies it in order to provide a line level output which you can then feed to your normal amplifier setup. Okay, after the boring technicalities were out of the way, it was time to go and buy some vinyl. And my first record, what else could it have been in 2016 but this, Radiohead's masterpiece, A Moon-Shaped Pool. Here it is in all its glory. Um, the artwork on the front and on the gatefold on the inside is by longtime Radiohead artistic collaborator Stanley Donwood. And it really pops in this format, doesn't it? You just don't, you just don't get anything like that with a CD. I think this one record, this one bit of vinyl, I think made me appreciate the many attractions of the vinyl format. So there really is something special about owning the music you love in a physical format. It connects you to your music in a way that digital downloads simply don't. From the moment you buy a record, you'll be impressed by the sheer size of the album, and it really makes you appreciate the album art. Some vinyl records, like this one, come in luxurious gatefold packages. Um, some of them have lyrics and band photos and sleeve notes printed inside. This one's just got stunning artwork, obviously. As for the records themselves, they remain fascinating objects. Look at this one here. Again, it's got a, it's got a kind of a custom slipcase, but just look at the record. They are lovely to feel and handle, although obviously you have to handle them with care. And the simple act of putting them on your turntable and dropping the needle on is incredibly satisfying. 
Also, if you buy vintage records, you are holding history in your hands, which means a lot to many record collectors. So I've got a couple of old records here. This is an original pressing, although not the first edition of Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. It was made, sold and owned before I was born. And I have to say, it's an absolute thing of beauty. It's been kept really well. There are even the posters that came with the original record in there. I won't get them out now. Here's another one of my favorites. Um, this, if anything, is an absolute demonstration of inflation. So this is Kraftwerk's Computer World, released, I think, in 1981. This copy was originally sold in HMV. Uh, it's a famous British record uh, chain if you if, if you're not from the UK. And look, back in 1981, it cost £3.99, a new record now. In fact, I bought the remastered coloured vinyl version of this, 24 quid. So that's inflation in practice just there. So old records absolutely do feel really, really special. Now the dominance of the streaming services with their clever algorithm-generated and user-curated playlists mean that modern music lovers tend to just flit between artists and songs, a bit like a bee with ADHD in a field of seriously tempting flowers. Now that's fine if you're predominantly listening to singles, particularly pop singles, but for those of us who grew up in an era when the album was absolute king, vinyl records encourage us to appreciate the album in a way that the artist intended us to enjoy it, as an uninterrupted, seamless experience. Take Depeche Mode's Violator, one of my all-time favourite albums. It's a perfectly sequent set of nine songs that just flow beautifully, except when you have to flip the record, of course. I think that in the vinyl era, artists really put a lot of thought into sequencing, and some of the great albums such as Pink Floyd's mid-70s masterpieces, David Bowie's Berlin trilogy, not to mention 80s landmarks such as Sign of the Times by Prince, the Joshua Tree by U2 and Paul Simon's Graceland, they're all testament to this art of sequencing and album planning. And let's move on to the modern era. We can talk about bands like Radiohead, Arcade Fire, Metronomy, Beach House, Elbow, even artists like Kendrick Lamar. The list goes on. All these are acts, artists who craft albums to be enjoyed as a whole. Look, you do get some dross with one or two hit singles front-loaded onto side A of a record. I'm looking at you, most of 1980s pop music. <laughs> However, if you are into albums and you choose carefully, you can even listen to them first on streaming services to make sure you enjoy the album, you will totally enjoy listening to complete albums on vinyl. You see, the main thing is there's no easy way to precisely skip tracks on vinyl records and therefore you end up just rolling with whatever's playing. I have to say it's probably the only time I listen to Maxwell's Silver Hammer off the Beatles' Abbey Road album. It's when I'm listening to the vinyl version of the album. I'm sorry though, Macca, it's still a terrible song regardless of the format. Now let's come on to a really thorny issue. Does vinyl sound better than CDs or digital music in general? It's a contentious issue amongst audiophiles, and it's almost akin to kicking off an argument such as whether Kirk or Picard is the better captain of the Enterprise in a Star Trek subreddit. I'm on the Jean-Luc side of the fence myself, if you're interested. Like all these things, there are hard facts based on technical specifications and measurable factors, and then there are opinions based on subjective listening experience. So let's get the facts out of the way first. Even the best vinyl record is incapable of reproducing the same dynamic range as a CD, and there's no doubt that vinyl playback is subject to much more potential distortion, measurable distortion, than any playback of a digital file. Vinyl records degrade as time goes on, and this is true of all analog music formats. So if you were objectively measuring the sound output, it would probably be technically measurably inferior to the output from a digital file, for example a CD or a FLAC file. However, subjectively, I think it's fair to say that many people prefer the slightly warmer, fuzzier, softer presentation of vinyl, and played through really good equipment, I think it sounds extremely appealing. Also, remember that the way music's mastered is crucial to how the final 
record sounds, and mastering an album to suit the idiosyncrasies and technical limitations of vinyl often results in a superior sounding mix. So take for example the vinyl reissue of the Red Hot Chili Peppers' terrific Californication album. It doesn't suffer from so much of the nasty clipping and digital kind of hot brash presentation that the original CD release did. But I think it's fair to say that vinyl is not all a bed of roses of course and here are some of the things that I as well as other people don't love so much about vinyl. Okay let's face it you have to have deep pockets to really get into vinyl and build up a decent sized collection as records can quite often be three or four times more expensive to buy than the equivalent CDs or digital files. And we're talking new records here, not second-hand ones. So as the cost of living right here in Brexit Britain skyrockets, it feels a little bit indulgent to me to pay three times the price to buy the new Arcade Fire album on vinyl, especially as I know that I'll soon be able to get the second-hand CD version for next to nothing. The other really annoying thing is that after spending a lot of money on a vinyl release, some labels don't give you an option to download a lossless digital copy. So quite often there's no download code or it might be a download code for an MP3 file. If you buy the CD, not only have you got the physical disc, you can also rip a flak copy. It just doesn't compare in terms of value for money. Let's talk secondhand records because these are also really expensive such is the popularity of the vinyl revival these days that you can't any longer just wander into a charity shop and find classics in excellent condition for next to nothing. You are only going to find dog-eared old tat in most charity shops nowadays. Now there are also of course many specialist second-hand vinyl shops which carefully grade the condition of their vinyl. They can often source rare records for you but once again you're not going to find any bargains. Online, uh, on sites such as eBay and Discogs, uh, these are another source of decent second-hand vinyl. Again, as long as you're prepared to pay the asking price. There are no bargains in second-hand vinyl land. Aha, you say, you stupid man, there's a flaw in your argument because records will always grow in value and you can always sell them for more than what you paid for them. Okay, well, I'd argue that the volatility of prices on the whole makes buying records not that good an investment proposal. But the main problem is that if you actually listen to the record, then any signs of even minimal wear and tear on the packaging or the record itself will reduce its value considerably. So basically, you're buying the record and not listening to it if you plan to sell it on. Now I've made this mistake myself. I bought this mint condition copy of uh, Air uh, CDs and LPs. Um, but look at it, I haven't even ripped the wrapping off. And much as I love Air, I haven't listened to anything on here. So I've rendered the whole thing a bit of a pointless exercise because I don't think I will sell this. It's not valuable enough to have appreciated significantly in value. So I'm kind of thinking, why did I buy this? In fact, do you know what? After I've made this video, I think I might just go and rip the cellophane off and enjoy listening to it. So I think my current philosophy with records is that I want to be able to buy them because I love the music. I want to support my favorite artists and I want to listen to them and keep them and maybe one day pass them on to my kids who'll probably just give them away to charity, but hey-ho. I want records to become part of the fabric of my life and I think that's why I still buy them. But let's come on to another problem that I've noticed when buying new records, inconsistent manufacturing quality. So this is the worst offender in my collection. This is Lost in the Dream, the 2014 album from uh, War on Drugs. Again, look, lovely deluxe package, heavyweight vinyl. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Nothing wrong with the music itself. War on Drugs are my favorite bands, and this is one of my favorite records from 2014. But this vinyl copy was flawed straight out of the sleeve. Now, when I played it the first time before scratching it up or anything, there were some really weird sound artifacts on side one of the first disc, along with some really annoying excess surface noise, which again, I wouldn't expect from a record produced in the last 10 years, brand new. Um, I thought this was really poor for a record that I spent more than 20 pounds on. 
and most annoyingly of all, it only came with an MP3 download code. That was like a kick in the teeth and a half after buying a substandard bit of vinyl. But look, even if you've got an absolutely perfect record out of the sleeve, we come on to another problem, which is that by their very nature, records are fragile and prone to degradation. The more you play them, the more scratched up they get, and this manifests itself in the form of increased annoying audio artifacts, such as pops and clicks, and increased background hiss, which is called surface noise. Yep, you can baby your record collection, and some people even think that the vinyl artifacts add charm and character to recording, as we've talked about before. But because of this, I feel that I don't want to overplay some of my most valuable and enjoyable vinyl records, which again, kind of defeats the purpose a bit. So for all these reasons, as much as I enjoy the full sensory experience, and actually the sound of vinyl, for me, it'll never form the main component of my music collection. After my initial infatuation records, I've probably bought about 50 or 60 within a couple of years, I've gone back to mainly investing in CDs and the odd digital download. They just work so much better for me, for the way that I listen to my music, which is not often sat in front of my speakers with easy access to my record player. The added versatility, not to mention the durability of CDs, wins me over every time, and it's why I still buy loads of them. However, there is still plenty to enjoy in the vinyl format for us music nerds, and I think it's fair to say that no other music format gives you that emotional and physical connection to your favourite music. I don't think that vinyl's in danger of obsolescence anytime soon. You can just go into any independent record store and you'll see so many young people half my age attracted and drawn to the peculiar appeal of buying and collecting records. And I think that's a great thing. I hope you enjoyed my little video love letter to the age of vinyl. Let me know what you think about vinyl records. Do you collect them yourself? Do you think they sound good compared to CDs? As always, pop your comments in the comment section below. It's always great to hear from you. If you enjoyed the video, do consider dropping a like and hitting the subscribe button. It's always great to, to meet new friends. Do pop over onto the Discord server. I'll try and be a bit active on that as well. But mainly, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video.